Uh, we are ready, sir. We can go ahead. Thank you, Sunny. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And Director General of Meteorology, Dr. Mahapatra, eminent speaker for the day, Dr. P.K. Thaplial, uh, other colleagues from uh, IMD, Dr. Narayanan is there, senior. Good afternoon. Very good afternoon, Dr. Narayanan and others who are joined here. I welcome you uh, on behalf of IMD and my personal behalf to the celebration of uh, 75 years of independence, Ajadi Kamrit Mahotsav. Uh, in the series of lectures being organized by IMD, uh, today we have a very important talk by Dr. P.K. Thaplial on satellite meteorology, the present status and future perspectives. As we all know that uh, during past few decades, there have been rapid advancements in the numerical weather prediction models and computational power. Uh, that has led to tremendous demand for three-dimensional, rather four-dimensional data mm -hmm. uh, on atmospheric state uh, over land as well as over the oceans uh, for defining the boundary and initial conditions of the atmosphere and forecastings at different time scales uh, need this data at different spatial and temporal resolutions. The surface observations and uh, also observations over oceans are rather scarce to meet the requirement of the present day high resolution NWP models. And satellites based instruments now have that capability uh, to provide that wealth of information required for initialization of weather models and also for monitoring the severe weather events uh, going on. And Integrated efforts are there across the world through the World Meteorological Organization and the coordinated group of meteorological satellites, uh, which provide the seamless global coverage from a suite of active and passive remote sensing instruments abroad. A number of satellites uh, being operated by different agencies and different countries. And the last decade has witnessed tremendous development in the field of hyperspectral infrared sounders and combined with all uh, weather microwave sensors uh, on these satellites that has led to significant improvement in the forecasting skills by ingestion of that data into the models. Uh, similar with the advanced imagers on board the satellites uh, have really helped us in real time monitoring and predicting the sea severe weather events like thunderstorms, tropical cyclones, heavy monsoon rains. And India started its uh, own uh, satellite program with INSET 1A uh, in the year 1982. And since then, there uh, we have the third series of satellites going on. Uh, so take us through all this journey and uh, what are the future perspectives. Uh, we have today with us Dr. P.K. Thaplial, who is uh, head of the Geophysical Research Par Parameter Retrieval Division at the Space Application Centers, Ahmedabad. Uh, Dr. Thaplial is a master's in physics from the HN Bahuguna Gadwal University and PhD from Indian Institute of Sciences. And he's working in the field of satellite meteorology at Space Application Center since 1995. Uh, he has contributed tremendously in the development of operational algorithms for retrieval of various data, the vertical profiles of the data which are needed to initialize the models. Uh, so its contribution towards improvement of the model forecast has been really very praiseworthy. And apart from that, he, this, he has significantly contributed towards the future sensor definition studies. During 2005 and 6, he was a visiting scientist at University of Wisconsin, where he worked on the development of these algorithms for hyperspectral sounders. He has worked as a key role uh, in development of uh, the multi-mission data reception and processing system for the INSET 3 series of satellites, uh, uh, which uh, has been transposed at IMD also simultaneously, and it is operational, working perfectly fine. Uh, presently, is also working at Associate Project Director for the Future Satellites, the OceanSat 3 Science and Applications part. Uh, he is an ISRO nominee on JIX, and also uh, he has authored more than 40 papers in peer-reviewed international journals and served as associate editor of the Journal of Earth System Sciences during 2012 to 2016. He is also executive of the Indian Meteorological Society Ahmedabad chapter. And uh, Dr. Thaplial for his services received the ISRO ASI award in year 2015, uh, PR Pisarati Memorial Award uh, by the Indian Society of Remote Sensing in the year 
2012 and J. Das Gupta Award by the Indian Meteorological Society in the year 2011 and 12. And also the ISRO Team Excellence Award for 2008 and 13. Uh, so we have very eminent person to speak on these. And before we hand over the floor to Dr. Taplial, I would request the Director General to kindly say a few words. Dr. Mahapatra, please. Uh, thank you, Hansab. Namaskar. Uh, and I welcome all our distinguished delegates and distinguished speakers, uh, Dr. Thapriyal. It is really an opportunity for all youngsters, students, and researchers to prevail this opportunity of listening to Dr. Thapriyal. As introduced by Mr. Sivan, Dr. Thapriyal has been an icon and an expert in this field of satellite meteorology, especially its application in weather and climate. There has been a well-known established relationship between Indian Space Research Organization and India Meteorological Department with respect to satellite applications for weather and climate services. And in this established relationship, Dr. Thapliel has played an important role be it the existing satellites or be it the future satellites in insert four series. So I have got the privilege to work with him and I know his potential and the knowledge to explore the new things in the field of satellite meteorology. So I will not take much. I once again welcome Dr. Kaplia and I thank all the participants, distinguished participants, especially the students, the young scientists, new new people entering into this field of science, either as a profession or as a hobby. I am really grateful to all these people for participating in huge number in this series of webinars being conducted from 18 in this series. Today, we have come up to the third day and we'll be continuing this program up to 24th for this iconic week of Ministry of Arts Sciences. So I hope uh, at the end of this today's talk, uh, we'll be more knowledgeable and we'll be in a better position to understand the satellites and its products. And we can look forward to the future applications of the satellites, especially in weather and climate services. So thank you very much. Uh, I once again welcome Dr. Taplia. Thank you, Dr. General of MD, Dr. Mahapatra, and the floor, Dr. Taplia is with you, please. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Namaskar, uh, Dr. Mahapatra, uh, DG IMD, and uh, all my senior colleagues from IMD, as well as uh, other centers, IMS members, and uh, also students. Most of the students will be maybe here in this, uh, this lecture. So welcome to all of you. And I'll be today, I'll be discussing about satellite meteorology. I would like to start, share my screen. Okay, so uh, Bansab, can you see my yes, screen? Perfectly fine, Dr. Okay, okay. So please stop me when you, you uh, if there is some interruption uh, because of uh, internet or you are not able to hear me, you can stop me anytime. Sure. So today is my, okay. So my talk today, is about satellite technology, so present status and future perspective. What I'll be discussing here is because I know there may be many students or, or newcomer in this field, so I'd like to briefly describe uh, meteorology and then I'll go into satellite meteorology. So meteorology, all of us uh, know very well that uh, we daily, in day-to-day -day life, we deal with weather, you know, but what we know about weather is it describes whatever is happening outdoor in a given place at a given time. So we all, whenever you go out of house, you always check how is going to be weather today, whether it is going to be hot, it is going to be um, cloudy, whether there will be rain or no rain. So these type of things are always, uh, we are worried about before leaving our house, okay? And then the second thing is when we when we talk about cl uh, this climate. So climate, climate actually is a long-term average. Mostly it is 30 years average according to WMO over a particular place. And if you see this uh, bottom graph, you know that 
there are you can see the two things one one curve is average temperature for last 30 years over Ahmedabad and then these bar are average uh, rainfall in Ahmedabad uh, this average of last 30 years so whenever someone want to come up visit Ahmedabad they will just like to look okay I'm visiting Ahmedabad in the month of May so how is how weather will be there so there may not be much rain and but temperature will be very very high if I visit Ahmedabad in the month of July it is likely that it will be raining there but temperature will be a little pleasant so we know that what type of clothes or what type of uh, things we need to carry to a place uh, based on its climate. Then, what is a meteorology? When we talk about weather and climate, we describe atmospheric state in terms of many parameters like wind, temperature, humidity, atmospheric pressure, cloudiness, and as well as precipitation. So meteorology is the science of atmosphere, okay? It offers the opportunity to investigating the forces that shape weather and climate. So what are those forces, what are those parameters which affect uh, our weather, our climate? So the, uh, the science of atmosphere is known as uh, meteorology. Now, the weather and climate, you know, the basic parameter which defines weather and climate I already uh, talked about, that is air temperature, air pressure, humidity, the cloudiness, precipitation, wind, and more importantly, radiation uh, over entire globe. So that defines our weather cli uh, and climate, okay, the atmospheric uh, state variables. Now, what is uh, the driving force of our atmosphere? So to know uh, meteorology, we have also have to know that what is the driving force behind atmospheric circulation and the, why weather and climate changes. So you can see here that our Earth basic source of energy on Earth is basically the solar uh, radiation. So solar radiation, you know, the, at the top of atmosphere, the energy is around 1,368 watt per meter square. It is intercepted by Earth disk, the cross section of Earth. Okay, now. This is the cross section is defined by pi r square, but then this energy which is intercepted by earth disk is redistributed over entire globe and the redistributed energy, you know, that will be around one fourth of the total energy. So it will be roughly 342 watt per meter square if you divide that into the spherical earth surface. Now you also know that the amount of energy which is falling from uh, sun is also not uh, constant, uh, same everywhere. Now it depends upon place to place. For example, over equator, you know that the energy uh, the, which we receive from the sun is maximum. And towards equator, it decreases. So the one thing is that equator will be relatively warmer and polar region will be relatively cooler. And the season changes because the Earth revolves around the sun in, this, in its orbit. And relative uh, this, uh, the orientation of Earth, you know, that defines that which whether this in this one, situation the southern there is southern hemisphere because solar regions are falling uh, perpendicular over southern hemisphere but exactly opposite uh, side after six months the sun rays are falling perpendicular over northern hemisphere so northern northern hemisphere will be a little warmer so this differential heating over entire globe it defines uh, it it, it uh, determines the weather of a particular place now earth is also rotating okay so the rotation and redistribution of uh, uh, the energy due to atmospheric circulation it it distributes the heat or uh, uh, throughout the globe so there are many various type of circulations which uh, drives uh, atmosphere i'm not going into much detail about that now why is that we need satellite we all know that uh, this uh, we have seen, uh, we have known that the, uh, this atmospheric circulations and uh, this uh, solar radiation they are determining uh, the, the season the climate of at a particular place but why we need satellite so the, 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 we need to monitor and predict all major weather events. And this prediction of these weather events, you know, there are various uh, scales available, starting from now casting, that is for few hours. We can say what is going to happen during next one hour or two hours. And then salt range is about one to two days, medium range about few days to a week, extended range up to a week or month. Seasonal, uh, uh, this uh, scale is about few months, or we can say that summer monsoon, okay, that is, uh, that comes in seasonal scale and then there is a climate scale. So all these scales, uh, monitoring and prediction requires a lot of data. And what type of data we, we require is a meteorologist uh, for now casting will basically require meteorological charts over a globe or, or, or over a particular location about pressure, temperature, humidity, wind speed and direction. So based on these, a uh, meteorologist can make uh, 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 this uh, prediction for next few hours, what is going to happen at a particular place. These, traditionally, these uh, observations are available from surface uh, met observatories as well as 
upper air observations over uh, limited over a few regions, few uh, stations. Okay. Now, whether for shorter time time scale, if you say that what is going to happen during next few hours or or over a particular place like Ahmedabad, Gujarat, or over Delhi. So those type of weather events, you know, the data requirement is regional. You do not need a global data for such type of. Uh, the importance of data is the regional data. But if you want to make weather prediction at longer time scale for few days to to a, say week, and that too over a large area, say entire India or Indian entire Asian region, then the, the, these weather events are influenced by global atmospheric state, and your data requirement will be global. You can see here. This is a globe and globe if you divide into a number of grids and then grids are not only in horizontal but also in the vertical. So you need a data of uh, say temperature, humidity, pressure, wind speed, everything, all this data you need at every grid uh, cells. Okay. So this type of huge data from where that will come. So we have weather observing systems, say this uh, automatic weather stations, uh, they are all operated by India Meteorological Department or any meteorological agencies. Uh, in other country, then we have Doppler weather radar, microwave radiometer. So these are all ground-based, land-based instruments that we use for meteorological observations. Then over ocean, we have buoys and buoy platforms. So they make observations of uh, meteorological parameters, as well as occasionally whenever we have a ship, ship also makes a measurement in route. Then there are airborne uh, this instruments. Aircraft can carry those type of instruments. But the most important is radio sonde. So most of the met stations they have uh, been launching radio sonde, where a balloon, the light balloon, the helium filled gap balloon, you uh, tie one instrument, and then this instrument records temperature, humidity, wind, wherever it uh, ascends in uh, in the atmosphere, and then transmits that data back to the earth station. Now globally, these uh, met agencies are making observation at fixed time, zero GMT as well as twelve GMT. So all that data is recorded and transmitted to uh, into global uh, weather um, agencies for use in their model or use in their forecast tool. But you know that those data are limited to a few places. But if you have space-based space uh, instruments, so you can see there is a dense network of satellites. I'm showing only a few uh, satellites here. There is a, these are the geostationary satellite here, and they are fixed over a particular place. So they are making continuous observation of Earth disk uh, uh, over that location, okay. Every half an hour or even today, we are we can make observation every five minutes. Then there are various polar orbiting satellites. Operation satellites are there, so they keep on making observation from a low altitude. Because they say about 700, 800 kilometers, so they are giving you better picture of Earth atmosphere or or the sea cloud pictures. Now this is a picture you can see. If you if you rely only on uh, ground based observations, so you can see these are the, uh, the uh, these observations from synoptic and ship measurement. They are these red dots you can see, and then these are the buoys over ocean. These are radio sonde only limited over few land uh, stations. Then there are pilots and profilers over few places. Then aircraft also makes measurement. But you know that if you see these done, there are many places which are data sparse where there is no observation. But if you make employ satellite, so satellite can provide you data over entire globe with with equal efficiency from equator to pole, from ocean to land, everywhere, even in, in accessible places, uh, observations can be made from satellites. Now, what type of satellites we have? We have basically uh, satellites from two uh, orbits. One is low Earth orbit, which are basically about a few hundred kilometers, 500 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers. So being uh, in near Earth orbit, they can provide you very fine imageries, fine resolution imageries of uh, Earth atmosphere, cloud systems. Okay. Now these uh, uh, these type of uh, uh, this uh, orbit, the satellites are revolving around uh, are are in an orbit which is a pole to pole. Okay. Now satellite is rotating from pole to pole, and Earth is also taking rot rotating. So a, a particular place will be. Uh, viewed only once per day, so one in ascending pass and one in descending pass. So every every day, two times a particular location can be uh, observed from uh, this uh, sun synchronous uh, polar orbiting satellite. So complete coverage is possible in two days time. But if you have uh, many satellites in different time uh, the slots, so you can have even better repeatability from polar orbiting satellite. So the advantage is here. 
you can see from polar orbiting satellite is they cover entire globe from pole to pole and close to earth that is around 800 kilometers so they give you sharper images and we have hyperspectral infrared sounding possible from uh, polar orbits which is not uh, so far available from geostationary platform then we also have microwave sounding and microwave radio meters available from polar or orbits we have active uh, instruments for cloud aerosol and wind measurements that they are uh, right, uh, currently they are available from all polar orbiting satellite but the disadvantage is we cannot see whole earth at one time because it's uh, whenever it uh, the pass is coming over a particular place then it makes observation but to cover entire earth it takes about two days time then temporal repetitivity is poor that is typically once or twice per day over a location but that can be enhanced if you employ more number of satellites uh, at a different uh, in the space of a few hours now you see this one the geostationary earth orbit uh, geostationary satellites so they are fixed they are in equatorial orbit and their rotation their speed in the, their orbit is very similar to earth rotation so they appear stationary over a particular place okay so they can provide you a, a, a complete uh, a full earth disk observation at all time if it, because it is fixed at one place so you can make observations as many times as you want you can have every half an hour you can have every five minute or even today these days you can have even better than one minute uh, repetitivity from history orbit now they can record images as fast as once every minute they view the view is always from the same perspective it's always looking from the same place so you can also derive motion of cloud that is the wind uh, the cloud motion vectors that i'll describe a little later but they are located very high you know 36000 km in space so they provide little uh, relatively coarser resolution imagery they cannot view polar regions because they they can only see uh, mostly up to say 60, 70 80 degree uh, south and north and so far there are no possibility of putting microwave or hyperspectral instrument on board geostationary platform hyperspectral anyway now it started right now chinese have put hyperspectral sounder on board uh, geostationary platform and next year you mentioned will be doing uh, that so i'll also describe that a little later in my other slides so a little bit about remote sensing so how we uh, do remote sensing of atmosphere so you know that the basic phenomena the source of energy is the electromagnetic radiation so one is invisible spectrum that is coming from sun okay so solar radiation it it gets reflected by cloud it gets scattered by atmospheric aerosols and it also gets absorbed by earth as well as reflected by earth so all these scattering reflection okay when you measure that by satellite instrument you know many features of earth and clouds uh, you can see those pictures during daytime when sun is available so that remote sensing is by virtue of scattering and reflection that is in visible spectrum the second thing is earth after absorbing this uh, solar radiation earth also heats up earth has its own temperature it's around 300 kelvin that is roughly from 25 to 30 degrees centigrade on an average average earth atmosphere also heats up because gases are absorbing radiation so earth atmosphere is also heats up you know that when you go up in uh, atmosphere the temperature decreases by about 5 to 10 degrees centigrade per kilometer so earth its atmosphere also has certain temperature so when you measure that emission from earth surface and its atmosphere cloud at satellite instrument satellite uh, instrument by satellite instrument you are basically measuring infrared and microwave region because earth emission is predominant in infrared and microwave region then third thing is scattering so you also do remote sensing by scattering in ultraviolet visible as well as in microwave so basically we employ uh, these three type of uh, uh, this uh, uh, properties of atmosphere or the, this interaction uh, of electromagnetic radiation by atmosphere and land surface for remote sensing of atmosphere now here you can see this just one uh, you can see the type of uh, satellite sensors we have for met applications basically we have two type of sensors one is called passive sensor passive sensor means your satellite instrument is only measuring the incoming energy the energy which is uh, either uh, visible in visible region which is getting scattered or reflected by cloud or reflected by earth surface and then it's measuring that is one thing is th this one that is visible uh, uh, this uh, imagery the second thing is in infrared also infrared also and microwave also earth is emitting earth in its atmosphere is emitting radiation and then instrument is measuring that so that radiation is also coming from 
earth and its atmosphere so basically your instrument is only measuring that okay only recording that uh, energy uh, which is emitted by earth and atmosphere so that also is known as passive uh, remote sensing so this uh, the examples are various type of radiometers or sounders uh, which are which i will describe a little later the second thing is active uh, this uh, remote sensing now active remote sensing we need is because earth uh, this uh, this earth atmosphere and land it's emitting energy and uh, very less energy because it's at a temperature of 300 kelvin i also uh, next slide why why so okay so now like uh, or even during night time there is no visible radiation so if you want to do uh, remote sensing uh, by by virtue of scattering like lidars so how you do that so you can have an instrument which is having a source of energy on your instrument itself and then you send that energy towards earth and its atmosphere and then record the reflected or scattered or back scattered energy at a tight instrument so that is called active remote sensing so the example of that are scattermeter altimeter gps radio occultation and LIDAR. so there are various uh, 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 this uh, example are there now here we can see if you want to get remote, do a remote sensing of uh, atmosphere uh, this atmosphere parameters what you want to know is uh, what what are those absorption bands in the electromagnetic spectrum so the first most important thing is solar radiation so solar radiation if you see if you are measuring at the top of atmosphere so this is a plane function by which you can define solar radiation okay so the peak of solar radiation is around 0.5 to 0.6 micrometer that is visible region now if you measure that energy at earth surface you will find this type of uh, spectrum it means there are various regions where this uh, solar radiation is getting absorbed in um, in the uh, uh, this uh, in the, by the atmospheric gases and by measuring the spectrum by measuring this uh, radiation intensity you know you can get the concentration of those various gases in the atmosphere water whether it is water vapor ozone or oxygen you can measure those concentration then if you move on here to the right side because earth's average temperature is about 300 kelvin so at 300 kelvin if you see the plane function that is the uh, that describes the electromagnetic radiation which is emitted by earth and its atmosphere it's around 10 micrometer to 12 micrometer is the peak okay so this region you can see this is the earth's emitted radiation so this is solar emitted radiation and this is earth emitted radiation now in earth emitted radiation if you are measuring at the surface earth surface you will be measuring this type of curve okay at different temperature but if your radiometer is measuring that energy at the top of atmosphere you will get this type of feature this type of absorption features that is the radiation in this range that is around 6 to 7 or 8 micrometer is strongly absorbed by water vapor in atmosphere and this region it is absorbed by ozone then after 12 micrometer it is absorbed by carbon dioxide so various gases in atmosphere they gives us clue about what is happening in atmosphere when we measure uh, radiation in these different uh, regions different absorption regions or window regions we get to know about various properties of atmosphere or or surface land surface from by measuring uh, this uh, emitted energy in different spectral bands okay so we have to keep uh, in mind uh, the absorption and emission features of various gases and most of the important gases in atmosphere are water vapor carbon dioxide oxygen ozone methane nitrous oxide and then there are uh, rayleigh scattering because of various gases as well as uh, aerosol now this is absorption uh, features in infrared and visible region but we also do remote sensing in uh, uh, this microwave so in microwave we have to keep in mind that there are major uh, absorption bands are there that is a weak absorption band of water vapor at 22 gigahertz a strong absorption of uh, oxygen around 50 to 60 gigahertz then one narrow one sharp absorption feature of oxygen at around 120 gigahertz and then again a big band of absorption band of water vapor around 180 uh, gigahertz so all these absorption bands will be used for uh, measuring various uh, atmospheric uh, parameters now apart from atmospheric absorption what other uh, spectral signatures you have to know about uh, uh, this land surface or about uh, any surface that is the spectral emissivity so emissivity of various surfaces is invisible 
uh, infrared and microwave is shown here. So you can see different type of lens, different type of surfaces exhibit to different type of spectral signature or emissivity in different spectrum visible infrared and microwave. So that also gives you a clue when you are making, making measurement in number of uh, bands, you get to know about surface properties from these type of spectral signatures. Now, uh, I will not go into much detail of radio transfer. I will directly come to basic satellite imagery. Now, you know that when radiance, when the satellite is making measurement in visible infrared, water vapor, and other absorption bands, what type of features we'll see and how we'll interpret those. So one very basic uh, is the basic radiometer, which, uh, uh, for example, insert radiometer, which day-to-day -day you see in your TV or your newspaper also, uh, the uh, satellite pictures of clouds. Now, this first one is visible image. This you can see only during daytime. Nighttime will appear black because the solar radiation is getting reflected by different uh, surface types and then your satellite is recording that. So these type of imageries are very, very sharp because solar radiation uh, is, is very, very is available. The intensity is very, very large, okay? Now you can see here, this is a cyclone, typical cyclone here. If you zoom it, you will see very fine uh, uh, features also from this cyclone. You can see, uh, you can also distinguish between land, different type of lands, there's desert here. Ocean appears black because ocean albedo invisible is around 5%, around 5%. So ocean appears black here. Okay, so you can monitor all atmospheric conditions, movement of clouds in visible uh, imagery. Now, when you go to infrared, that is about 10 micrometer, 12 micrometer. So in 10 micrometer, 12 micrometer, there is no solar radiation available. So there is no question of reflection from solar radiation. So what we are basically measuring, seeing is, we are seeing basically the emitted energy from Earth and its atmosphere. Now. Earth, uh, this, this emission is depends upon temperature of any surface. So if the temperature is large, you will, you will, you will get large radiation. If temperature is less, you will get less radiation. So basically the basic uh, the imagery, you will see cloud as black and land as white, bright, because large radiation from land. But because our perception to see cloud is, uh, uh, is different, that we want to see cloud in white, so all th uh, every time we invert these image, uh, infrared images, and by in inversion, we see cooler uh, surfaces uh, uh, in the bright uh, color and warmer surfaces in the darker color. So whenever you find the dark surfaces, it means temperature here is very large. So they are basically land regions without cloud cover. Wherever there is cloud, you are only seeing sensing radiation from clouds because radiation from surface cannot uh, pass through uh, this cloud cloud because cloud absorbs infrared radiation so what essentially you see is only radiation coming from cloud top okay so you can differentiate different features from infrared imagery and this type of imagery is the similar type of imagery you can see from daytime as well as nighttime because it does not depend upon solar radiation now moving on to third this imagery this is water vapor imagery so water vapor imagery basically this is from six to seven micrometer so here water vapor in atmosphere strongly absorbs the radiation. So whatever radiation is emitted by Earth's surface gets absorbed by water vapor layer in upper atmosphere. And what you see is only radiation which is emitted by upper troposphere. That is about, uh, uh, say, uh, 8 to 12 kilometer. So that layer, water vapor emission only you can see. And these features are basically the water vapor image, this movements or the air circulation at upper troposphere. So those features are very important for uh, forecasters. They know that which are the region where there is a rising motion and which, which, which are the region where there is sinking motion so that, so that they can uh, predict a future course of weather. So these type of imageries are interpreted by forecasters in their own way. Now I am coming to uh, the parameter table because this type of imagery only is uh, just a quick look at what is going to happen, how weather is changing. Okay or you want to monitor a movement of clouds, so you can monitor from this type of imagery. But actually, when you want for numerical weather prediction, you want uh, those parameters, or atmospheric parameters, okay? Like temperature and humidity profiles, atmospheric wind, sea surface wind, sea surface temperature, rainfall, soil moisture. How do we get all these parameters from satellite? Apart, because you know that you, these are, your ability to measure these uh, parameters from land surface is, is limited to a few places only. Now, when we go to satellite, uh, this uh, satellite meteorology, 
we have to keep in mind these absorption features whenever we make a measurement okay so this is uh, this already I have described that the, uh, this uh, earth emitted uh, spectrum and there are various uh, absorption features around uh, the CO2 in 4 to 6 uh, micrometer here, then water vapor from 6 to uh, 8 uh, micrometer, then ozone around 9 to 10 micrometer and CO2 from 12 to 15 micrometer. And um, uh, this uh, microwave I already I described to you. Now, if you see the sensitivity in microwave, so microwave sensitivity for different parameters, this curve you can explains very nicely. So if you want to make measurement of ocean salinity, the sensitivity is maximum at one point around 1.4, 1.5 gigahertz. If you want to make measurement of wind speed over ocean, the maximum sensitive sensitivity increases and the maximum sensitivity is about 10 uh, gigahertz and after that it saturates. The third parameter is water vapor. So atmospheric water vapor, there is no sensitivity up to 10 gigahertz, then slowly it increases. It's highly sensitive at 22 gigahertz where there is uh, an absorption band and then again it decreases and then again it increases towards 40 and higher uh, gigahertz, higher frequencies. Cloud liquid water, cloud liquid water again, you can see the sensitivity increases constantly up, up to 10 is negligible, 20 gigahertz, little higher and it's highly sensitive to liquid cloud at around 30 to 40 gigahertz and it increases beyond that region. For sea surface temperature, the maximum sensitivity uh, is around 6 gigahertz. You can see here around 6 gigahertz and up 10, at 10 gigahertz also there is sufficiently large sensitivity. So these all these, uh, these uh, uh, principles you have to keep in mind when you want to make measurement from satellite, which frequency you have to uh, make measurement uh, so that you can me make a measurement of that particular parameter. So microwave, most of the microwave radiometer, you know, they have 1.4 gigahertz, they have 6 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, 18 and 22 gigahertz. Then we have 30 to 40, uh, between 30 to 40 gigahertz one channel and one around 87 gigahertz for ice clouds. So those uh, those uh, parameters are, uh, are decided by uh, the sensitivity uh, parameters. Now I'll go one by one and briefly I'll describe how those uh, uh, these parameters are measured. So temperature profile and humidity profile in atmosphere they are uh, measured by making observations in number of uh, absorption bands, okay? So for example, this is water vapor absorption band here for insert uh, 3D, and this is absorption band for CO2 from 12 to 15 micrometers. So if you have number of observations in these uh, absorption bands, you, you can see the weighting function tells you, these are the weighting function for each channel. It tells you the radiation is emitted from which layer. And if you, when you know that, when you know that I'm measuring, my instrument is measuring radiation uh, from this layer, it means the, uh, this channel is giving you information about temperature in this atmospheric layer. This channel is giving you temperature information in this atmospheric layer. And this one is giving you uh, temperature information about 300 uh, uh, hectopascal. This one around 700 hectopascal, and this is around surface. So by making measurement in number of channels, you can construct temp temperature profile in atmosphere Similarly, when you make observation in water vapor absorption band, you know that they are having weighting function in different region in the atmosphere. So you get to know the concentration of water vapor in different layer in atmosphere. So I'll not go into much detail here. So the only thing is the measurement in different absorption band, different channel in the absorption band gives you information of about radiation emitted from different layer in atmosphere. And that in turn, give you information about temperature and humidity in the atmosphere. So you can see a typical example here by uh, measuring by measuring uh, radiation in different spectral bands, you can invert that to get a temperature profile uh, from surface to about uh, 40, 50 kilometer and water vapor from surface to about tropopause. So this is from our own insert 30 satellite. Now, how do we get atmospheric wind? Atmospheric wind, basically, we uh, if you have sequence of imageries, okay, if you have, you can see here the animation. The, these uh, clouds are moving. So by making uh, the quanti quantitative estimation of this movement of those tracers, you can know that what is the uh, the what is the wind velocity at a particular height. So what you need to do, you have to identify a tracer. We have to track that tracer in next two to three images within one or two hours. Then. From that, you compute tracer motion vector. 
then you assign the height based on the temperature brightness temperature of that pixel you know that this cloud is at certain height so the, if the cloud is at suppose 500 millibar you say that the height of the wind uh, that we which you derived is about 500 millibar if height of uh, that cloud is uh, say uh, 100 millibar then it means the wind vector which you derived is at 100 millibar so from that you deduce these type of cloud motion vectors and similarly when you make measurement in water vapor uh, channel so you can see here this animation that water vapor movement you can uh, measure here and a similar type of tracer identification you can find out what is the wind uh, this velocity or wind vector at that uh, upper troposphere so these are very much helpful these two parameters are very much helpful for numerical weather prediction because otherwise these informations are not available uh, uh, from other sources so now this is the, that was the atmospheric wind now how do we get sea surface wind because sea surface wind is most important parameter because the moisture is coming from ocean surface okay moisture which during monsoon season if a lot of moisture is uh, is, uh, uh, is 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 evaporated from ocean surface and to know that how much moisture is uh, evaporated how much latent heat is released from ocean surface you need to know uh, the sea surface temperature and you also need to know the what is the sea surface wind vector okay and for cyclone also this is very important because when these type of uh, uh, these moments are there you know that a cyclone is forming over this region this is a low pressure area and uh, and a strong cyclone uh, is forming over this region so sea surface wind is most important parameter uh, here so we have here again we have two type of measurement one is passive micro microwave technique that is radiometer where we can get only wind speed second is active microwave uh, remote sensing that is scatterometer that is what we do this uh, scatterometer is sending uh, this uh, microwave signal towards uh, uh, this uh, ocean surface and there are two beams inner beam and outer beam okay this is a rotating type of uh, this antenna here and in observation in two different direction and and at before and after when it's moving in, in its orbit it also gets two measurement from the uh, one two in the forward direction and two in the backward direction so you have total four uh, measurement in two uh, this uh, frequencies horizontal as well, as well as vertical so from those measurements you can uh, retrieve sea surface wind vector not only only speed but also direction but if you have a radiometer radiometer can only give you uh, the wind speed because wind speed will change the roughness and roughness will change emissivity of ocean surface and that emissivity you know that will dip, that will change the brightness temperature which your sensor is measuring so that will give you only wind speed now another important parameter is sea surface temperature again there are two techniques one is ir technique in infrared we know that we have atmospheric window from 10 to 12 micrometer where atmosphere uh, absorbs very little uh, this uh, radiation only cloud can uh, uh, can absorb in this region so if the sky is clear there is no cloud so your image your uh, uh, this atmosphere is fairly transparent okay now why we split this one that even if there is no absorption it is not actually free free from absorption there is a little absorption by atmospheric water vapor so by splitting these two when we make measurement in channel number five and channel number six of the in thermal infrared band one uh, of the channel is little less affected by water vapor other one is uh, is uh, highly affected by water vapor so the difference of these two brightness temperature of these two gives you uh, the knowledge of water vapor present in atmosphere so that you can correct so by making an algorithm what you can do is uh, you can make an empirical algorithm these days we also have a physical uh, uh, physical retrieval type of techniques where you can employ a radio transfer model and a first guess to uh, to fine tune your sea surface temperature now infrared are very very accurate their accuracy is typically better than 0.5 kelvin then and they also have very high spatial resolution better than 5k these days we also can get, have a sea surface temperature at one kilometer resolution they are insensitive to rough, uh, surface roughness because surface roughness does not does not change emissivity in infrared but the limitation is they are limited by cloud if this cloudy region you cannot get uh, sea surface temperature from your satellite they are also little affected by aerosol and atmospheric water vapor and you need cloud detection and cloud clearing to get accurate uh, sea surface temperature uh, measurement from thermal infrared 
Now the second technique for sea surface temperature is microwave technique. Now, as you know that sea surface temperature, maximum sensitivity is at uh, 10 gigahertz, gigahertz. And six gigahertz happen to be a region where water vapor absorption is very, very less. There is no absorption because of water vapor or liquid cloud. So uh, your six gigahertz can even penetrate cloud, can penetrate through cloud and makes measurement of sea, for sea surface temperature. So when you have a radiometer at six gigahertz, 10, 18, and 20, 21 gigahertz, you can retrieve sea surface temperature. The primary channel is six gigahertz and other channels are used to do correction for sea surface wind speed as well as little correction for water vapor. But these, these actually these techniques, you know, the microwave is less accurate. Their accuracy is from 0.5 to one Kelvin. Then, but they are all whether they have all weather capability, capability they can uh, make measurement even in, in the presence of cloud or strong water vapor presence. But still, they are rain limited. If rainfall is high, you cannot make measurement of sea surface temperature even from this uh, type of radiometer. They also have very coarse uh, spatial resolution, typically 50 kilometer, although they are suitable for numerical weather prediction. And also, you know, that sea surface temperature variability is not very large. It does not vary large within few kilometers. So that itself may be sufficient for numerical weather prediction. They are also unaffected by aerosol and water vapor but they are sensitive to sea surface roughness and salinity. So those two parameters have to be corrected when you want accurate uh, sea surface measurement. One example here you can see is microwave radiometer can give you sea surface temperature everywhere except few regions where there is rainfall, okay? The middle one is ABHRR, that is the uh, infrared technique where you can get sea surface temperature with very high spec spatial resolution, but only th those places which are free from cloud. Cloudy regions, they are the white regions, you do not get sea surface temperature measurement. But you, but if you combine microwave with uh, this infrared, you can make a merged product. And uh, then they are the Reynolds merged, merged product of SST and they are everywhere they are available. Then comes precipitation. Uh, that is the most, uh, you can call uh, rainfall or uh, snowfall. But we, we, we do not call here rainfall or uh, snowfall, we call it precipitation, it can be in any form, okay? Now, there are basically three types of sensors available for that. One is infrared, microwave, and third is the merge product. In infrared, uh, basically, if you make uh, one cross-section, if you have the cyclone scene, if you make a cross-section from A to B, okay, the A to B, the radar gives you rain. This rainfall from A to B, you can see, you can see that which regions are having high rainfall. So this region, there is very high rainfall. This region, no rainfall. This region, no rainfall. This is near sur surface rain, so you can exactly, you know, that radar is closely matching with your actual surface measured rainfall. So radar, you know, that active sensor is giving you very accurate uh, information of rainfall. Visible is not giving you very good rainfall. It's not have correlated well with uh, uh, this rainfall. It's only correlated with cloud top uh, brightness. Infrared also has some uh, correlation with the, this uh, uh, the rainfall in from A to B. And if you combine microwave, so microwave, you know that if you are making measurement from 19 gigahertz, 85 gigahertz, you combine that, you get very good uh, uh, knowledge of rainfall within uh, this cloud because infrared and visible basically, they are only sensing cloud top. They are not looking at anything below cloud because of the strong absorption and microwave can see through cloud. So they also interact with the cloud droplets or rain drop droplets within cloud. So they give you better better measurement of uh, rainfall. Okay, so I'll not go into much detail. There are various techniques for precipitation measurement. The most uh, one is the Arkin method, where you in 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 set type of measurement where you make a large uh, box and you count the pixels which are having a brightness temperature less than 235, and that fraction you use in Arkin's uh, this uh, technique, and you find what is the rain rate over that region. Then there are other type of rainfall. They are all available from inset uh, rainfall and you can get them from SAC as well as uh, IMD. These are the high spatial resolution rainfall product from uh, inset uh, 3D, 3DR. And microwave, you know, microwave can penetrate through cloud. So they can go deep into cloud and provide you information about uh, uh, the rainfall profile as well. Soil moisture, soil moisture again, it depends upon uh, this uh, emissivity in microwave. In microwave, uh, you know, the emissivity is strongly depending on water, water presence of water in the soil. If it is a dry soil, 
your emissivity is of the order of 0.9 to 0.95, very high, close to one. But when water is having emissivity of 0.4 to 0.6, so if there is a mixture of soil and water, the brightness, the, the emissivity can vary from 0.4 to 0.9. And that large contrast in emissivity uh, makes a large contrast in brightness temperature. And that brightness temperature information, which you measure, gives you um, uh, this uh, amount of uh, soil moisture, soil, uh, moisture uh, over the different uh, places. Now, uh, I'll give you a brief, brief history of uh, the satellite meteorology, how it started. The operational mission, there are various operational missions there which have planned continuity. Okay, but there are various research missions which are one off missions, they are only for technological demonstrations. So, may, both type of uh, satellites have been flown on by different space agencies for during last few decades. The first meteorological satellite is actually the Tyrus, which was launched on 1st April 1960. That was having only visible tele television camera. So that was the start of uh, the satellite meteorology. And this is the typical Im image, which is stitched together by observation over two, three days. So you can only see the cloud features uh, in this image. This is, so this is the image from first mid satellite meteorology, uh, the satellite which are dedicated for meteorology. Then Nimbus 1 was launched in 1964. That also had IR radiometer, which can also see during nighttime. So first satellite could see only during daytime. Second satellite could also see during night time. Then Nimbus 3, that was in, launched in 1969, that has first in satellite infrared spectrometer. So that was used for atmospheric sounding. So it provided you temperature profile in the atmosphere. Then 1917 launch of Nimbus 4, it also added a water vapor channel apart from visible and infrared. And uh, the, to, to it, uh, this today's uh, imager also, you know that we have uh, visible water vapor and uh, TIR uh, imagery, uh, TIR channels. As well as that, that, uh, that satellite had sounder for both temperature as well as water vapor profile because water vapor channels were added into that. Then 1972 was the Nimbus 5. It, was ha it had the first microwave spectrometer. So microwave sounder uh, on board this Nimbus 5 for tropospheric temperature profile and microwave radiometer also for cloud water content and sea ice studies under all weather conditions. Then Tyrus and that is the NOVA series. NOVA series uh, was launched some, somewhere around 1978. So this is actually the start of operational satellite era where uh, this uh, satellite had advanced very high resolution radiometer that is the visible and infrared radiometer having very high spatial resolution. Then Tyrus operational vertical sounder so this is again the uh, sounder having infrared uh, adsorption bands as well as microwave uh, sounder uh, and microwave sounding unit and high resolution infrared sounder. Now after that, then came NOVA KLM series in 1998. So this was the much advanced version of your NOVA pipe earlier series. It was having advanced EVHR, that is advanced, a very high resolution radiometer as well as ATOPS. So ATOPS now has uh, this is advanced Tyros operational vertical sounder. So this has Hertz, that is high resolution infrared sounder, 20 channel uh, in the infrared, as well as AMSU A and AMSU B. So combined uh, infrared and microwave sounding unit. Then recently, this uh, series has been replaced by JPSS series, 2017 onwards, which is having now very high, uh, this very high, uh, this visible and infrared imaging radiometer sensor as well as cross track infrared sounder. So this is hyperspectral sounder. Now we have hyperspectral sounder on board, polar orbiting satellite and advanced technology microwave sounder. This is the microwave sounder here and ozone measuring as instrument. So this is, I'm talking about NASA uh, NOVA development. Then how geo, uh, geo uh, satellite, you know, how they, how development of geo satellite uh, took place. The first satellite was launched in 1966 that had only day night, daytime viewing capability. The second one in 67 had the first color image of Earth disk. Then geo operational environment satellite goes. It started in 1975 with the visible and infrared spin scan radiometer and goes for that in 1980, it was it had the first uh, atmospheric sounder that is this R atmospheric sounder uh, onward goes for. And then from here onwards, the operational goes uh, series started the GOES-8, uh, that is I series from 1994, and then GOES-N series after 2006, there were three axis stabilized imager and sounder, which we already had from our beginning, beginning uh, insert uh, 
series of satellites. Now, recently, GOES R series uh, started after 2016 that has advanced baseline imager. So now, in the in the metro in the uh, geostationary orbit, we are moving from sounding to pseudo sounding. And the pseudo sounding because the advanced baseline imager has few channels which are used for uh, water river sounding. But in future, we will have a hyperspectral sounder on board uh, geostationary platform. So then again, from pseudo sounding, we will go back to a hyperspectral sounding there. Now, one thing I would like to tell you here that what is uh, the importance from multispectral sounder to hyperspectral sounder when we move from a multispectral sounder where spectral resolution is of the order of 18 centimeter inverse, very coarse uh, spectral resolution. And when you move on to very fine spectral resolution that is available from current hyperspectral sounder, your accuracy improves. Accuracy of temperature profile was around 1.5 to 3 uh, Kelvin uh, for multispectral sounder. And then it improves. And then for very high spectral resolution, hyperspectral sounder, it became 0.5K to 1K for temperature and 10% uh, accuracy for water vapor, which was actually 30% uh, for water vapor in case of multispectral sounder. So this tremendous development happened during uh, last 15 years uh, after launch of uh, two, uh, this uh, three, we, basically we have three uh, hyperspectral sounder, aqua airs, atmospheric infrared sounder that was launched in 2002. Then Metop Yasi, which was launched in 2006, and then JPSL series, which just now I described around 2018. So every day we have uh, two uh, descending and two ascending passes. So this covers entire globe and operational numerical weather forecasting has improved. Uh, it has taken a quantum jump after these type of observations were available for uh, uh, assimilation. Now, one, um, one problem comes here. When you use, when you talk about uh, atmosphere sounding from infrared, infrared actually is the best type of sounders where you can have very high sensitivity, very high spatial resolution. But the problem is it is cloud limited. And you know that most of the time earth is covered by cloud. So if you see one simple, one very nice diagram here, where it shows that if your spatial resolution of your, uh, your sounder is around 10 to 15 kilometer, your chance of getting clear pixel is only 10%. But if your spatial resolution of your infrared sounder becomes one kilometer to two kilometer, your probability of finding a clear pixel is definitely more than 50%. It is around 70%. So chances of finding clear pixel is very, very high if you have very high spatial resolution and very less if you have coarser spatial resolution. So what do you need basically? Either you need a pseudo sounder, sounder type of uh, imager from polar or geostationary uh, orbit where you can find those type of holes within uh, uh, clouds and where you can make atmospheric sounding. Or if you have coarser uh, atmospheric sounding of the order of a 15 uh, kilometer footprint, you have to do cloud clearing on those, uh, those pixels which are contaminated by cloud. And those cloud clearing you can do by using this high resolution uh, imager or Otherwise, if you have simultaneously available microwave uh, radiometer or microwave sounder, it's outer side, you can see outer uh, the 50 kilometer resolution from AMSU A and AMSU B. And within that, you see uh, three by three, that is the nine uh, pixels of hyperspectral sounder. So these, this one observation in, in, in uh, microwave sounder can do cloud clearing of these nine pixels of uh, infrared sounder. And that can provide you sounding even in presence of cloud by employing uh, a combination of uh, infrared and uh, microwave sounder. So effectively, if you have only infrared, you get only 5% to 10% sounding over entire globe. But if you have cloud clearing techniques available using high resolution imager or coarse resolution sounder, then your yield or your cloud clearing radiances increase to 70%. So over 70% area in the globe, you can have sounding and that, you know, that improves uh, your uh, numerical your capability to do numerical weather prediction uh, and drastically. Now these are the quickly go through those uh, these uh, uh, slides which uh, shows uh, different current satellites. So Equa and Terra, which was launched in 2002, uh, sorry, uh, Terra in 99 and Equa in 2002. So they had one moderate resolution imaging spectrometer, MODIS Coban in both satellite. And MODIS, you know, from for me it is actually a, a, a pseudo sounder because it has two to three channel for water vapor, but spatial resolution of one kilometer. So it can provide you uh, those type of uh, capability that even if it is cloudy, it can find some holes within those uh, cloudy regions and give you 
uh, this atmospheric stability uh, for uh, now casters. Okay, and then aqua two is much advanced. Here all the instruments are for satellite meteorology. This first one is hyperspectral sounder airs. Then microwave advanced uh, microwave sounding unit, the microwave sounder. Then MODIS is pseudo sounder or uh, high uh, resolution imager. Then energy balance, uh, energy budget uh, instrument. Then microwave radiometers. Radiometer, you know, that I already described. They are also used for various applications, starting from sea surface temperature, wind speed, water vapor, and cloud liquid water. Then came Metro of series. Now, you know, these days we have two types of series. US is operating uh, this uh, uh, Nova series. I will come a little later. And Europeans are operating Metop series. So Metop series, uh, the time of equatorial crossing is around 9.30 to 10 o'clock in the morning. So every day around 9.30 to 10 o'clock, you have at least one of these satellites passing through a particular place. Okay, so Metop A was launched in 2006, B in 2012, and C in 2018. And they have uh, continuity planned for next even next 20 years. So you can see the suite of instruments here, this hyperspectral sounder, then uh, this uh, broad spectral uh, resolution sounder here, hers. Then microwave sounder, microwave humidity sounder again here. Then high resolution imager. And then ozone uh, monitoring instrument. Scatterometer for sea surface wind. And then uh, this GNSS instrument, which makes uh, use of uh, this radio occultation for um, accurate uh, uh, this profiles. Okay, so I'm not going to much detail, but you can see here, hyperspectral sounder can provide you so many parameters. Temperature profile, humidity profile, ozone profile, cloud cover, cloud top temperature, cloud top height, and all other trace gases in atmosphere from this single uh, the satellite. Okay. Then uh, this JPSS series, this is the Metop series, and JPSS series again very similar to Metop series, where you have advanced micro sounder, you have hyperspectral sounder that in infrared, you have high resolution uh, this uh, imaging and uh, the imaging radiometer. Then you have a cloud, uh, this uh, radiation uh, energy budget, uh, uh, this instrument, and ozone measuring instrument here. So very similar to METOP, we have JPSS series. And this also, you know, the continuity is planned. JPSS 1 was launched in 2017, 2 will be launched in 2021, then 26 and 31. So you have so many parameters which are available from uh, combination of these different instruments for atmosphere, land, ocean, and whatnot. You can see all type of uh, uh, parameters are listed here. Now, uh, this geo missions. I think we are I'm running out of time, so I'll quickly go through some of the slides. So, geo missions uh, international scenario. The GOES series I already described you. They initially they had only five channel imager and 19 channel sounder, but now recently after 2016 they have uh, launched GOES R series, and this GOES R is having one advanced instrument that is advanced baseline imager. And these are the instruments. So the instrument, the channels which we have seen in MODIS from polar orbiting satellite, they are all mostly those all channels you can see now from geostationary orbit. And this advanced baseline imager, again, I call as pseudo sounder. So this has replaced earlier sounder from gold series of satellite. And this, you know, they, there are three channels here, channel eight, nine, and 10. They are used for humidity sounding. And uh, uh, there are three channels here they are used for uh, 14, 15, 16, they are used for temperature sounding. So apart from atmospheric sounding, you have various applications here. You can get cloud microphysics, you can get uh, vegetation uh, indices, you can get even atmospheric motion vector with very high, uh, this special resolution available. And there are so many parameters, uh, the list I'm not going through. Uh, maybe I, I will make uh, these my presentations available, so you can go through them later on. And then this another important uh, channel here with this uh, sensor here is, Geostationary lightning mapper. So now, because this is stationary over one particular place, the satellite, so you can have a lightning mapper which can send you very high frequency, high refresh rate imagery, and you know that which are the region where there is lightning is happening. Okay, and this ABI, surprisingly, you can see in 15 minute time, it can provide you one full disk. It can provide you three continental US observations, 30 mesoscale imagery that is about 500 500 kilometer imagery every 15 minute. So these type of capabilities, if you have, you can do now casting with very good uh, efficiency. And there are so many applications here, starting from now casting, aviation, air quality, and this uh, land surface uh, applications. Uh, so this is the satellite which most of the satellites are now are having. So this is the uh, Metaset series. So Metaset also now they are from Metaset second generation itself. They had actually advanced imager 
uh, having 12 uh, channel here. And you can see the even sample imagery here. You can see all the features very clearly here. So this heavily is high, uh, this uh, advanced imager. And then this also had one energy radiation budget instrument from Metrosat satellite. And Metrosat third generation, which will be launched next year, the first satellite, this will have, we call it that, uh, this will have a first sounding instrument, hyperspectral sounding instrument on board, geostationary plate platform. Right now, Chinese have already launched uh, a hyperspectral sounder, but so far we have to yet to see those results from that satellite. But this, we know that Metrosat satellite is an operational uh, series. So we will, we are sure that this data will be available to all the user community. Now, imaging satellite is again, this FCI is again, uh, this uh, uh, similar to advanced baseline imager on Gojar satellite. This will also have a lightning imager and then there will be infrared sounder, hyperspectral sounder available on the satellite. And from that hyperspectral sounder, you can generate very high quality atmospheric wind from the various water vapor tracer. So this will be an, a very exciting uh, this observation which we will uh, be getting from uh, Metrosat third generation hyperspectral sounder on board geostationary satellite. Now uh, quickly I'll go through this uh, again. Japanese also have the Simawari, that is advanced Simawari imager. This is again also similar to advanced baseline imager. And then KMI also has advanced uh, this uh, meteorological uh, imager that is also similar to AHI. Now you can see over the complete scenario over uh, this globe, all over we have advanced imager, Goj East, Goj West, European, and Himawari and KMI here. And Indian region only we have to fill by advanced imager. Currently, over Indian region, we have one side, we have the uh, Indian Ocean data coverage from Severi, that is also hyper, this advanced imager. And other side, uh, this uh, east side, we have Himawari uh, 8 or 9, and that can cover up to Bay of Bengal region. But certainly we will try to fill this gap in future by advanced imager. Right now we have only insert 3D, 3DR uh, imager and sounder here. Now, another important thing is radio occultation. So radio occultation, is an, an emerging actually field where you can get very accurate uh, temperature and humidity profile and with very high vertical resolution. So here, what you do, if a GPS satellite is transmitting a radio wave, if there is no atmosphere, it will pass through straight line and your receiver will receive it uh, without, without any delay. But if this uh, radio wave is passing through atmosphere, there will be a significant bending due to uh, re reflection within atmosphere due to variation in temperature and humidity. Okay, and then that is measured by this receiver here, receiver satellite here, and when it measures that bending, the bending is proportional or is a function of temperature, humidity at different height. So by making occultation at different places, you can uh, you can construct temperature profile and humidity profile in the atmosphere, and these type of instruments gives you very very high vertical resolution of temperature and humidity profile. So one day, typical uh, right now, we have many satellite uh, GPS receivers here. So we have these many occultation in one day. So see, sub, uh, right now, they are not sufficient for uh, numerical weather prediction. But in future, once we populate uh, uh, these uh, type of receiver in, uh, our, uh, in our various satellites, so maybe the num number density will go up and we will receive uh, better uh, observation for NWP. So other important constellations are GPM constellation, Global Precipitation Mission, where various satellites are making measurement for rainfall, okay, for precipitation uh, measurement. They are all infrared or microwave active as well as passive instruments making measurement for precipitation. Then there are atmospheric train concept where many satellites, just like a train, they are placed by, they are separated by a few minutes in orbit and because you cannot put so many sensors, so many active or passive sensors in one satellite. So instead of that, you make a train type of thing, and then that you make a many measurement in atmosphere. Now I come to Indian uh, scenario. In India, you know this, uh, we have this polar orbiting satellite. So far, we do not have any operational series. We have only ocean set series, which is operational. In 99, we had first satellite, uh, ocean set one, that was having microwave scanning, uh, multi-channel scanning micro radiometer and OCM. Then Ocean Set 2 in 2009, which had scatterometer for uh, sea surface wind. Then Saral, which was a, a joint uh, French uh, this satellite, which is having altimeter for sea surface sight, waves, as well as wind. Megatropic was uh, actually, uh, this was again an Indo-French Indo collaboration, which had a radiometer Madras, 
and then humidity sounder saphir then scribe is radi uh, radiation measurement uh, this instrument and then radio occultation uh, this uh, instrument scribe set was was launched in 2016 after fail of failure of uh, ocean set to uh, scattermeter so fill the gap that scattermeter alone was uh, launched uh, similar to our kalpana uh, to fill the insert uh, series now this scattermeter is again providing sea surface wind vector and now we have planned for ocean set 3 which will be launched towards end of this year or early next year that is again having ocean this is scattermeter ocm as well as sea surface temperature monitor which will provide you 1 km resolution uh, sea surface temperature now i'll not quickly because this uh, insert i have already uh, anyway insert i think i am not described so indian uh, this uh, history from uh, for insert uh, series of satellite the first satellite was launched in 82 which was having only vhrr visible and thermal infrared uh, this channel and now this one series one was built outside india this, this was built by us and uh, this provided wealth of information on uh, clouds and uh, olr cloud motion vector rain and cloud imagery then insert 2 series was built by isro in uh, this was our indian made satellite and uh, this has again the similar type of instrument having visible and thermal infrared uh, uh, channels for uh, these par many parameters uh, cloud imagery rain cloud motion vector as well as olr then real uh, change came in insert 2e and kalpana which had actually water vapor channel in addition to visible and thermal infrared in 99 and kalpana was just to fill the gap between insert 2e and insert next satellite insert 3a now the quantum jump in indian this metallurgy came in the form of this launch of insert 3d that was launched in 2013 so this had an advance this was similar to goes uh, klm series and uh, it have a uh, imager having six channels visible sphere channel mid infrared water vapor and split window tir1 and tir2 as well as a multi channel sounder that is 18 channel in infrared and one channel in visible so it provided wealth of parameters i'll show you a list later on and then 3dr was uh, followed in 2016 so right now we have two satellite in orbit 3d and 3dr and 3ds is already ready in our lab and anytime it is required it can be launched to replace any one of these satellites. So now this is the 3D, 3D R uh, sounder. You can get a temperature profile and very important for now casting. You get these uh, forecasters can make use of uh, uh, T5 gram at any location to uh, know the weather of weather during next few hours. And uh, I'll not go into many much details. This is 3D and 3D R imager. So six channel imager. So you can see now these are the advanced imager you can see many features very clearly and if you see the multi-channel imagery color composite you can get various features the fog this is snow here with this pink color then this brown color is a cirrus cloud on top of cloud so various things uh, you can identify and you can get a cloud micro also from this uh, this type of advanced imagers now recently we have made an operation of this multi-mission uh, data reception and processing system, IMD RPS operational in IMD. And this is having now wealth of uh, parameters. You can see how many parameters are there, More, almost 32 parameters from insert 3D imager and about 17 parameters from sounder. So those parameters uh, are, these are advanced parameters, including cloud microphysics, which are very useful for uh, this now casting, as well as clear sky brightness temperature, which I will show in this slide and they are routinely uh, assimilated into NWP models for uh, forecast. And these are the history you can see the IRS P4 Ocean Set 1 from MSMR, though it worked for only few, uh, uh, one year, uh, around one year, it provided wealth of data. And you can see we have, we could measure sea surface temperature, water vapor, sea surface wind, cloud liquid water with very good accuracy. But this was one of uh, experimental mission, and after that, there was no follow on or no operational continuity of this satellite. Megatropic again, it is a joint mission with the France. I already described this one, and you can see what it provided total precipitated water, cloud liquid water, ocean surface wind, and rain rate from Madras. So, Madras worked only for a few months, and, uh, and after that, the rain was retrieved from other uh, the Saphir instrument. Saphir provides uh, this, uh, the relative humidity in a number of six number of layers in atmosphere and you can see an example here and this is the uh, scarab radiation budget with a long wave flux and is a short wave flux at the top of atmosphere and this from this you can uh, uh, compute the radiation budget of our earth atmosphere scatterometer 
The scatterometer you can see here, again, I already described, uh, it can provide you sea surface wind vector. And this is used for uh, in, set, in, in, in in combination with the, uh, this uh, scat set, it is used for uh, cyclone, uh, cyclogenesis, cyclone track prediction. And OceanSat 3, which will be launched uh, this, uh, this year end, which this also has uh, capable of one very good potential for meteorological observations because it has a scatterometer as well as two band sea surface temperature monitor. So all these red uh, color parameters uh, starting from sea surface temperature, LST, sea surface wind vector, polar sea ice extent, global sea ice extent, rainfall, atmospheric wind, they are all useful for uh, this uh, atmospheric application or meteorological applications. And the GI set two, which will be launched uh, within a few months, uh, maybe next year it will be launched. This also has a long wave infrared channel having 1.2 kilometer resolution. And we plan to have about six channel. And this will be a demonstration of advanced imager on board geostationary platform before we launch our own advanced imager on uh, future uh, uh, satellite series. Now, recently we have, but recently means two years back, uh, in, a uh, joint committee was formed uh, by IMD and ISRO, and in the leadership of Dr. M. Mahapatra, who is the DG uh, IMD now, we submitted this report for fourth generation inset. Uh, so the strong, because future satellites will depend upon a strong user requirement. So this requirement was submitted in form of a committee report, and we have planned advanced imager and lighting imager and the, with the first priority on inset fourth generation satellite, as well as high Spectral sounder that can be either on uh, from geostationary platform or, or polar orbiting satellite or from both the platforms. Then we are also working on microwave temperature and humidity sounders that will be that will be launched uh, soon uh, after uh, the, the user uh, agreement. Then we are also in making of microwave imagers and GNSS RO is emerging field. So in that direction also, future we have to be uh, we, we will be working in this uh, direction also. But these all. Uh, requirement has to come from user agencies and then only ISRO can make uh, these instruments. Now you can, you know that satellite measurement, they have substantially improved numerical weather forecast over recent decades. And because of this, various space agency, agencies, there are there is actually strong international cooperation in the field of meteorological, meteorological satellite. And most of you know that CGMS is a body where most of the space agencies meet, or uh, met agencies meet, and they decide about uh, coordination of future meteorological satellites. Now this, uh, some of these slides I'll skip. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm sorry I've taken uh, uh, a lot of time here. And now floor is open for question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Taplial. And a uh, few questions have come. <clears throat> Sunny, can you put them before Dr. Taplial, those questions? Well, few questions are there. So uh, first question is, has been asked by Mr. Uh, Prajwal, what are the limitations that limit us to making geo satellite of limited IR channels like 18 in the case of inset? Oh, okay. Actually, this is not limitation. We we are now what we are saying that this is technological development. It, it development takes uh, with time. We develop. We have come come from inset one, inset two, and then next we are going uh, forward to inset fourth generation. And that's what I explained that. We will be going for hyperspectral sounder where we can have thousands of channel uh, from interferometry, uh, interferometry, uh, interferometry type of instruments uh, in geostationary platform. So uh, it's not that the user requirement has to come. Uh, that's what I explained earlier that there was a requirement for uh, this 18 channel sounder because most of the operational operational sounder globally had 18 channel sounder. So similar type of sounder because it's heritage uh, type of thing. So we also continued with that. But in future, because in now recent development, we have already seen that there are hyperspectral sounder on board polar orbiting satellite, and there are, there are efforts for geostationary platform. So we are moving. We are also moving into that direction. And regarding imager, also right now we have only six channel. But that's what I said that we will be going for advanced uh, this imager, which will have at least some of the uh, sounding channels. So we can call it uh, pseudo sounder, but they will have that will have very high spatial resolution of one to two kilometer so they will not be limited by uh, the cloud so right now the problem with 18 channel sounder is that uh, we have a spatial resolution of 10 kilometer and one diagram i showed you where it says that 
with 10 kilometer your uh, uh, clear detection probability or your probability of finding clear pixel is only about 10 to 15 15 percent so most of the time some part of cloud will be encroaching your uh, field of view and you will not be able to make a very good uh, uh, this uh, sounding so future either you go for uh, a high resolution pseudo sounder that is advanced imager which i talked about or you go for hyperspectral sounder clubbed with a microwave sounder in polar orbiting polar, polar orbit or you go for a high spatial resolution hyperspectral sounder from geostationary platform so these three options are there which we are looking for in future okay sir so second question from the same mr prajwal so what are the advantages of having the two different kinds of instruments in the same satellite platform like chris and atms of the jpss series in somi npp okay yeah so that's why i i described no i said what i said is if you have the hyperspectral sounder infrared sounder infrared sounder can give you very high accuracy very high spatial resolution but they are limited by a cloud so whenever a cloud comes in your field of view even five percent cloud comes in your field of view it will make your observation useless okay in that case your error will be very very large and the chance of getting clear field of view is only 10 percent less than 10 percent so if you combine that with the microwave sounder like atms advanced technology microwave sounder so microwave sounder is used to do cloud clearing on your infrared pixels and when there is totally cloudy if it is a fully cloudy pixel then in that case uh, that infrared that infrared that ARC cannot work or chris cannot work in that case there will be microwave only sounding okay so you have to make a global sounding so there will be three scenario infrared only sounding that will be the best where this is totally clear field of view uh, only 10 percent less than 10 percent cases will be like that then there are cases where there is partially cloudy and you make it uh, cloud cleared based on your microwave uh, instruments and then those uh, you make you increase this uh, uh, to uh, say about 70 uh, percent and then the third case is only uh, this uh, cloudy scenes so, so in that case only atms or that is a microwave sounder only that will work so you make a uh, hundred percent uh, coverage for sounding only uh, raining condition you, you cannot get again uh, those type of sounding but then you have to somewhere you have a trade off if you have only infrared you get nothing you get only 10 percent cases so third question from mr prajwal are there any plans isro is having for air quality monitoring from the satellite flight similar to the korean geostationary environmental monitoring spectrometer satellite also why are all geo hyperspectral instruments are uv vis based but not ir mw based uh, okay so if you want air quality you know the air quality it depends upon strongly upon uh, the scattering so the remote sensing part here is the scattering so scattering uh, from the aerosol you know the, you have to go towards the ultraviolet because in visible the scattering is not that large the scattering from, from 0.5 to 0.6 micrometer region the scattering will be very very less so if you really want to get air quality so your frequency your instrument has to make measurement in the ultraviolet region below point uh, below 0.4 micrometer so, okay so that's why we use uv uh, type of instrument in that type the, in, in, for air quality monitoring we are also going into that direction in future we will we are also proposing uh, those type of in, information but now with changing scenario users have to propose if user if there is a strong demand from any ministry or any user agencies uh, uh, that they want air quality they want a sensor for air quality monitoring we can definitely make those type of instrument there is no problem we cannot we cannot make those instruments Thank you, sir. So next question is from Mr. Manish. Uh, any comments on the situation of validation or a comparison between the ground-based or in situ observation with the satellite-based observations over the Indian region? Uh, uh, validation of ground-based and uh, satellite. Yes, we, we, we regularly we are regularly doing that. And recently, under this MMDRPS project, you know, which which I described that we have. Now, jointly, we have made it optional in IMD. So under that, we are currently, we have made all the software ready where all the all the satellite, um, um, these parameters will be validated, routinely validated with the ground-based observations. Okay, and every month or, or every day, or every month, a report will be generated for that. Thank you, sir. That's all from the question side. 
Bansa, I have one question. Uh, please, Pana, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, so the very interesting talk. Thank you, Dr. Thapli Aji. Actually, my is simple thing that uh, as, you, uh, as we have seen, gradually the volume of satellite data going for NW model is increasing. And uh, if, because number of satellites also gradually increasing, data are increasing, and the volume. But with respect to model part, that is fine. But when we come to the observational study, using satellite data, it is very limited. Uh, what is the reason for that? Means whether it is, it is not accessible properly, whether the sound or data are not very highly reliable, or what are the things? People are not using this uh, satellite data for observational study, very limited. Though it is exponentially increasing as far as the model part is going on. Can you put some light on that? Yeah, actually, this is a very, very important uh, question. Actually, this question, basically, your development of satellite programs, sat satellites, you know, it also depends strongly upon users. This There is a recent paper by Paul Mengele, which, which uh, you know, it clearly says that the development in all NOVA satellites, it was a, a because of uh, European, you know, ECMW, when they, when they assimilated uh, their pro uh, products during 70s, when they tried to assimilate, when they tried to use uh, sounder uh, products, there was no impact, very less impact was there. But after two, three decades, when radiance assimilation happened in 90s, after the start of radiance assimilation, they found that there is a drastic improvement in their uh, this uh, forecasting. And then they gave input that, no, this type of, uh, because uh, radiance assimilation is giving very good impact. So we should improve the quality of radiances. And then they moved on to hyperspectral sounder. So when user requirement is there, when the user can say that, if you give me this type of observations, I will, this will improve a numerical weather prediction. So instrument designer can make that type of instrument. Okay. Now insert 3D sounder right now, this also can be used for various applications where there is severe weather, those type of applications, it can have, it can be very much helpful. But mostly what I said is during last 10 to 15 years, there is a rapid development in the field of hyperspectral sounder combined with advanced technology microwave sounders. Now, already every six hour cycle, your, your assimilation cycle, these data are going freely. It's not that it's not that it's not open to IMD or NCMR developer. All your agencies, uh, these uh, are using data. So initial data, already high quality, high hospital observations combined with microwave observation is there. The impact of inside 3D radiances will be less. Okay. But the important, you have, we have to see that the importance of insert 3D sounder is in temporal revisit. You can get this data every one hour. Okay, but the, whereas other satellite, you know, that they, they will give you every six hour, every, every 12 hour. So we have to make use of this type of capability for, uh, for now casting. So that's what we have to, we have to make uh, most of the users aware, even not only IMD operational forecasting agencies, but even universities or IITs, they have to come forward to develop techniques how to best use uh, these uh, these satellite observations for some new innovative uh, applications? Sir, I have one question. Huh. That whether uh, the ISRO has any facility to monitor and provide advisory information on space weather phenomena expected to affect the high frequency radio communications, communications yeah, yes, yes. satellite. GNSS yeah. Yeah. system. We are we are lacking in that direction. Actually, space weather now our next satellite uh, will have that type of instrument. Uh, so, uh, but so far we do not have uh, any satellite for which is ma ma making measurement of uh, space weather. But this uh, report, this fourth generation insert thirty uh, three insert fourth generation uh, report, we have also mentioned importance of space weather. That no, if not in in that fourth generation first satellite, but priority wise, we can also uh, develop uh, space uh, this uh, weather instruments and put those on geospatial platform because that is that is very very helpful. So that is where the users the, the users which require those type of uh, type of observations should come forward and strongly demand that we want space weather uh, this uh, instruments. Then only uh, we will be able to make that. So yeah, ICAO has already implemented the space weather phenomena advisory informations that uh, states had to implement this uh, since last year, 8 November 2020. What was that? 
Gao has already implemented uh, the space weather information and advisory phenomena, advisory of okay. this phenomena. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, so we will move into that direction also. We will, uh, right now we already have one, uh, uh, just now I'm not recalling the satellite name, but uh, this year it will be, this within the next uh, few years it will be launched. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Kaplial, one more question has come. Uh, that is Anu yes. Mishra from IMD. How far we are from having a satellite mission with a space-based radar similar to GPM or TRMM? Okay, yeah. So that also that also we are working on that, that field also, yes. But I, I, I cannot tell about time frame because again, uh, I emphasized in my last slide that uh, development of any of the instrument from ISRO side will require a strong user requirement. Yeah. Yeah. User, a strong user requirement is there. If you can pro yes. uh, prove that it is the uh, it is uh, it is is it's is, is needed for uh, your application, uh, definitely that instrument can be developed. So, and if there are no more questions, uh, let's all thank Dr. Taplial uh, for taking us on board various satellites and having us made a journey through the history of satellite and the science of satellite meteorology, the atmospheric retrievals, visualization of the atmosphere in one go, and also the capabilities of the current satellites and future missions which are planned not just by India, but also other agencies across the world. Because satellites are a shared facility uh, across the world. It's that are freely shared and utilized by all the agencies. Uh, so it was important at Thaplial to have a view on what are the other international agencies are planning or are currently having the facilities and also the use of satellites for various applications in weather forecasting and other applied sectors. Uh, it was a beautiful talk at Thaplial. We feel enriched and thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ram sir. I thank, uh, thank you for inviting me to deliver this talk uh, on our uh, Ajadika Amrit Mohsav. And really, this is a great privilege for me to deliver this talk. And uh, you have uh, my information, my email will be there. So any any student or any participant uh, want to ask any question in future, uh, you can please feel free to contact me. I'll be happy to answer or discuss uh, anything. Thank you. We're grateful, Dr. Tapliya. Thanks a lot. And thank, thank you, you thank everyone you. else. Thank you very much. I invite you tomorrow at 3 o'clock again on two very important talks. One on heatway and other is on radar. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.